Hello and welcome to lecture three of unit one. Today we are going to be looking at how Spain comes over to the Americas and establishes its empire in the Americas. But first we need to figure out, you know, why Spain is even over here, how it gets over here, um, because at the beginning of this lecture, Spain has no knowledge that there is North America or South America. There is nothing over there in their opinion, but um, we're going to get to a place where it's known that these continents are there and Spain claims an empire. So we start with in the 1400s, Italian and Arab merchants began to trade with Asia. And they're trading with Asia and they make a lot of money. So if they're making a lot of money trading with Asia, other European nations are, are going to become jealous of the money that they're making and they're going to start looking to trade with Asia. And that means they're going to start looking for different routes to Asia. And the important part here is that there are different routes. Um, the routes that the Italian and the Arab merchants are using, they basically have those things sealed up and they're not letting any other nations use them, so they need other nations need to find different routes. To find better routes, you need a good navigator. Okay, um, just make sure that when you see these bold highlighted things are bold and things that are underlined, maybe you should highlight them in your notes. That's what I would do because if you don't, you might not remember them. I would highlight them in my notes like I just did. Um, so basically if you need if you want better routes you need a better, a better navigator. So Portuguese Prince Henry and he becomes known as Prince Henry the Navigator. He sets up the first schools for navigation and so he can get some better navigators. Because if you want to be a teacher you need to go to school to be a teacher and you need to learn those certain skills just like if you want to be a navigator you need to learn how to navigate so he would he set up these schools and then he would pay for trips down the african coast and these were the first trips that kind of get people started on this exploration and finding new things and it leads to this age of discovery all right that's what we call this it's the age of discovery and that's what we're going to talk about Columbus and all that kind of good stuff. And the Portuguese got very good at sailing because they had the best navigators. All right. This is Prince Henry with his awesome hat. Um, right over here on this map, you will see in the red shaded area is Portugal. Um, the yellow part of the map is n land that is known of. And the Italians and the Arab merchants would sometimes go over land to get to Asia. They could go through the Mediterranean Sea, but then have to get onto land and get to Asia. Or go down this way, get in the water again, and get down to India. So it's not a very efficient traveling route and you can't carry as much stuff because you have to go over land. So what Prince Henry is trying to do is he's trying to send his sailors down the coast of Africa. So they are not aware of anything in the green area. All right? They for all they know Africa could stop right here and it could all be water or um the or Africa could go on forever. They just don't know. So he is sending people down the west coast of Africa. The first person that we're going to talk about is in 1488 with Bartolomeu Diaz and he sails all the way to the southern tip of Africa. So he leaves from Portugal, follows this path to get down to the southern tip of Africa and he calls this the Cape of Good Hope because he has good hope that he has found a route to Asia. He gets down here and it's water 
and it's more water and it's more water and he's like okay we found it we did it we just need to keep going but his crew doesn't want to keep going so they turn around and go back to Portugal ten years later Vasco da Gama continued up the east coast of Africa so he follows the same type of path doesn't stop at the Cape of Good Hope keeps going and he is found an all water route to Asia by getting to India they, this discovery meant that Portugal had a great way to trade with Asia, and they started making money. And once again, when people start making money, other Europeans start getting jealous, and they start looking for other routes to Asia. And that's where Christopher Columbus comes in. Christopher Columbus thought that he knew a faster way to Asia. He sailed west through the Atlantic Ocean because he thought that he would be... If he sail, sailed west, he would get right to Japan and the Philippines and... Um, China really quickly. The problem is Christopher Columbus thinks that the world is a lot smaller than it actually is. Um, he thinks that he's just going to sail across the Atlantic and Asia is going to be right there. He doesn't realize that there's an entire continent and thousands of miles of ocean. So he goes to Portugal and he asks Port the Portugal king if he can get some money to go and go west and travel and get some ships and a crew and all that kind of stuff and the the Portuguese king says no so Christopher Columbus goes to the Spanish king Ferdinand and Queen Isabella and they sponsor him or give him money because they wanted a piece of the Asian trade because Spain had no was having no success in their exploration and they wanted to take a chance on Christopher Columbus. Isabella also wanted to spread Christianity, and we'll talk a little bit about spreading Christianity um, in a later slide. After years of waiting, Columbus set sail on August 3rd, 1492. They sailed for four weeks with, that, with no sight of land. So, can you imagine being on a ship for four weeks? You don't really know where you're going. You're not really sure how long it's going to take. And you haven't seen land in weeks. So for all you know, you could just be going around in a big circle in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. But finally, they land on an island in the Caribbean Sea, which is south, just south of Florida. But Columbus believes that he is in Japan. And if you can imagine where the... Well, I'll show you a map here. This is where he thinks he is. And this is where Japan is right here. This is where he actually is. So he is almost a whole entire world apart from where he thinks he is. This is the problem. Columbus, this is up here, this top map, the white map up here, thinks he thinks that the world is this big. And what's missing from this is the whole North American part and a little bit uh, and, North, and South America and then some of the Pacific Ocean. So he is basically saying that this part of the world doesn't exist. But he is wrong, and he thinks he's in the Philippines and the Indies, but he is nowhere near Japan. So he's going around for three months, visiting islands. He found gold and pearls, which is convincing him that he's in Asia. He returns home, and no one suspects that he has reached an entirely new continent. Everybody still thinks, yeah, way to go, Chris. You made it, man. You did it. You did it. You made it to Asia, and everything's great. But really, he has not. He just landed in the Caribbean. So this sparks a lot more exploration, and he goes back four times to... He never actually lands on the mainland of North America up here. He does get to Central America right down here. And he does touch a little bit of South America, but he never gets up here. So we'll talk about who does here in just a little bit. But this starts a lot of arguing between people because Portugal says, oh, this is our land. And then Spain says, no, this is our land. This is our land, whatever. So the Pope, to end all the fighting, drills an Amer imaginary line around the world called the line of demarcation. This line decided where what decides what countries control what lands Spain would get so Spain would get lands to the west Portugal lands to the east this da dotted line right here is the line of demarcation and this would all be Portugal over on this side this would all be Spain now the problem here is 
Portugal, after they've realized that there's a lot more land over here, Portugal thinks, well, we kind of got gypped out of this situation. And they start getting really angry, and they demand that the two countries meet to discuss the line, and they agreed to a new treaty called the Treaty of Tordesilia, and this treaty moves the line 800 miles west. This allowed Portugal to control most of eastern South America. Um, if we go back to this slide, you will see that they get just a little bit right here, and they control most of this area, and they expand even past this line because after years and years, this line kind of becomes worthless, but right now it's important because Spain claims all of this, Portugal claims this part, and then a lot of Africa too. So, so why are these people wanting to explore? There are three main goals of exploration. We call them the three G's. God, gold, and glory. God, they wanted to spread Christianity. And glory, they, the explorers wanted the fame. Kings wanted the power. And to get power, you have to get more land. Because if you can get more land, you can get more resources. And if you can get more resources, you can make more money. So they want the power to expand their empires or expand their control. And then the last one is gold. Everybody wanted gold. It's more money. So G, G, G. God, glory, gold. After Columbus, there are more Europeans who explore the new lands. In 1501, Americo Vespucci, with his awesome hat, set out to find Asia just like Columbus did. He gets there, and he actually lands on the mainland of North America, and he real realizes that this land is not Asia. Impressed by the account of the new lands and that he is able to recognize that it's not Asia, a German map maker names the land after America and names it America. So that's who North America and South America are named after. Moving on to Ferdinand Magellan. He proposed that he could reach Asia, Asia by going around South America, but he did not count on the fact that the Pacific Ocean was so vast. In 1519, he set sail with five ships and 270 men. So, five ships, 270 men. Let's re try to remember that, huh? Okay. He made it around South America. He finally he gets down here. This is the tip of South America. Antarctica is all the way down here. So, it's really cold. Um, and there's ice, obviously. Penguins, probably. So, he goes through here. And these are called the Straits of Magellan. And look how narrow and crooked and hard it is to, to navigate through this. Well, what they do is they lose a lot of ships because it's not easy sailing. And they don't have little canoes. They have big sailing ships. But he makes it around South America, goes north, northwest, and reaches the Philippines after a lot longer time and then he gets out in some of the islands in the Philippines he is killed in a local battle but his crew forges on and in 1522 three years after they left only one remaining ship makes it back to Spain with about 20 men so we start with five we start with five ships we end up with one we get 220 and we end up with like 270 we end up with about 20 so um, someone said today that it is a it was a successful failure because they did make it around the world, but at what cost? So, all right. Now, now that people know that there are l new lands over there, the Spanish want to go over and take over those lands and get those resources. But the problem is there are people already there, like the Aztecs and the Incas. So H Hernando Cortez is always going to be connected with the Incas, all right? You need to know that. Or the Aztecs, sorry. Hernando Cortez is always going to be connected with the Aztecs. Hernando Cortez landed in Mexico, because that's where the Aztecs are, with 580 conquistadors. And conquistadors are people that are like soldiers and are conquering lands and helping Fernando. They're like soldiers that uh, basically just kill people and kill 
these Aztecs. Montezuma II sees these people with their big ships and their shiny armor and their horses that he's never seen before, and he fears that they are gods returning to con for the throne that he is that he holds. He is the emperor of the Aztecs. Now, remember we talked about how the small tribes that the Aztecs control, they do not like the Aztecs. So, the Spanish decide, hey, small tribes, you don't like the Aztecs. We don't like the Aztecs. Let's just get together and kill them. Kick them out. So that's what happens. Spain, the Spanish make alliances with the native people who hate the Aztec rule. Cortez and his allies of Native Americans march into Tenochtitlan, which is the capital city of the Aztecs, and capture Montezuma. The people in Tenochtitlan, the Aztecs, fight back and trap the Spanish and their allies in the city. They, the Spanish al and their allies try to escape, but in the process, a hundred or eighteen hundred of them are killed in one night, known as La Noche Trista. Cortez go makes it out alive, returns back with some more of his Native American allies, and eventually overthrows the Aztecs. So the Aztecs are no more. So moving on to the Incas. In 1531, Francisco Pizarro led 180 men into Peru because that's where the Incas are. So, Incas, Francisco Pizarro, Peru. The Inca emperor went to greet them, but the Spanish just killed thousands of Inca and took him captive. And they did a lot of the same stuff that the the Spanish the Spanish did a lot of the same stuff that they did to the Incas that they did to the Aztecs um, use their ally or use their enemies against them, and once the emperor was dead, everything basically fell apart. So, how were the Spanish able to take over such great empires with such few men? I mean, these people—we only got 180 people right here. Um, the first thing is that they weakened the Aztecs with alliances, with by making alliances with their enemies, like the smaller tribes that didn't like them. The second thing is that they spread on not on purpose, but they spread European diseases, and that killed millions of Native Americans. All right, because Native Americans at this time do not have immunity to the common European flu or cold or whatever virus, and if they catch the cold, a cold, they're just going to die. So it's not as easy as just getting over it you pretty much just die the last one is that the native americans just kind of gave up because they had been beaten into submission because the spanish acted so brutally towards them over time and other things are like guns um different styles of warfare and we'll talk more about that later but um these are like the three main things all right, so that's lecture three. The next lecture will be all about um, what happens when these other European nations come over and try to move in on Spain's territory. All right, thanks for your time.